The spiritual world is real. That's right. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, wherever you are. My name is Rod Hembry. And I'm Janice. And this is Bible Discovery TV, where we are discovering the Bible from Genesis 1 to Revelation 22 every single day. Today we're in Matthew. Corey, what's going on? I'm going to be taking a look at the scribes and the Pharisees who are mentioned a lot in the Gospels and sometimes overly demonized in Christian circles. We're going to take a look at that in a little bit. All right. Look forward to finding out about that. Janice, mm -hmm. what do you do? Hear him. Okay. <laughs> Hear him. Very good. Ryan, you're up. Well, here's a question for us. Is the prophet Elijah one of the coming two witnesses before Jesus Christ's second coming? Well, this is the question we're going to attempt to answer a little bit later on. All right, let's get into the Bible and listen to God as he begins to speak to us from his word. Here it is. Matthew 17, verses 1 through 9. Now after six days, Jesus took Peter, James, and John his brother, led them up on a high mountain by themselves, and he was transfigured before them. His face shone like the sun, and his clothes became as white as the light. And behold, Moses and Elijah appeared to them talking with him. Then Peter answered and said to Jesus, Lord, it is good for us to be here. If you wish, let us make here three tabernacles, one for you, one for Moses, and one for Elijah. While he was still speaking, behold, a bright cloud overshadowed them. And suddenly a voice came out of the cloud saying, This is my beloved son, in whom I am well pleased. Hear him. And when the disciples heard it, they fell on their faces and were greatly afraid. But Jesus came and touched them and said, Arise, and do not be afraid. When they had lifted up their eyes, they saw no one but Jesus only. Now as they came down from the mountain, Jesus commanded them, saying, Tell the vision to no one until the Son of Man is risen from the dead. Matthew chapter 17, verses 1 through 9. Matthew 16 to 18, that's what we study today. That's our reading assignment. We are going to be focusing on something a little different. Now, the Lord Jesus Christ was fully God and fully man. This is an extremely difficult concept for us to grasp. Likely the touch of sin on our mind doesn't help us, nor does the fact that we don't have anything to truly compare the incarnation to. How then should we think on this? It's, it's helpful to remember that Jesus, or just like Jesus, no other man in history, his birth also is like no others in history. Did you get that? The birth of Jesus Christ is unique. He was not born of a typical union between man and woman. Mary was a virgin. To prove this, it's in the Bible. In fact, the Bible says that the Holy Spirit caused Jesus Christ to be conceived. This holiness became a dominating factor in Jesus' growth. Now, the Bible records how when he was just 12 years old, Jesus stayed at the temple instead of following his parents home. As he had known them and expected them, they came back. And when Mary and Joseph found him, they scolded him, to which he replied that he was about his father's business. Later in life, Jesus also operates outside his disciples' expectations when he is transfigured in front of them. Now, what is God attempting to show us through these things? And that's what we're going to focus on a little something different in the life of Jesus. Now, how does this come to play? Because a lot of people believe in Jesus the man, but Jesus God? Yeah, take your Bible guide, turn to today's passage as we study this, because I love the New Testament. It's great, and it talks about Jesus Christ. We're going to have a few more weeks of these teaching through the Gospels, which is excellent. Um, the Gospels are excellent. 
So this is the time that you need to read your Bible and not get afraid. Don't get afraid. A lot of people have gotten afraid and they got behind and they didn't catch up. Well, just, just start right where we're at now. Uh, if you can write to us or go to BibleDiscoveryTV.com, click on the page and it will take you to the place where you can be a part of what's going on. I call this, what else? The transfiguration. What in the world am I talking about? We're talking about Matthew 17, verses 1 through 9. Father, Jesus Christ, Holy Spirit, one God and three persons. <laughs> Help us to understand what this is about. Help us to hear you. Help us to know you. Help us to learn what you did and why you did it. In Jesus' wonderful name, and we all said together, amen. Now let's look at this because it's really important. The Bible says, after six days, Jesus took Peter, James, and John, the three disciples, his brother, led them up on a high mountain by themselves. He's got the three of them up there. And he was transfigured before them. What does that mean? Well, here's what it means. His face shone like the sun, S-U-N. Like the sun? And his clothes became as white as the light, L-I-G-H-T. The light? You see, the body of Jesus Christ and the things clothing him was changed. Now, humanness is a part of our physical, but the corruptible cannot inherit the incorruptible. We will be changed in eternity. What I'm trying to say is that Jesus Christ shows us that in the midst of who he is, there's something different about him. Holiness. His holiness. He is God. Fully God. And he is fully man. How is that possible? I don't know. I can't think of an answer. But I can tell you, it's possible. There's a lot of things I can't think of an answer for, but I know it's possible. And I know it happens. Now, it's very important to remember that. This is what the Bible says. Now, let's go back to the Bible and let's learn some more stuff. Matthew chapter 17, verse 3. Here is what the Bible says. And behold, or take note, Moses and Elijah appeared to them talking with him. What? you got to be kidding me. What I'm saying is the Bible tells us the spiritual world is real. It's real. Their personalities are real. People are real. Let me tell you something. You know, they believed in the commandments. So the second commandment says, don't make an image of anything. They didn't draw. They didn't make pictures. Today we have pictures and statues of people in the past. They didn't do that because that was a violation of God's commandment. Isn't that interesting? So how did they know that it was Moses and Elijah? How did they know that? Well, they knew that because somehow the spiritual DNA of both of those men was revealing. <laughs> I'll tell you, they were with Jesus Christ. Talking with him. The personalities were there. That's amazing. This gets really good now. Watch this here. Matthew 17, verses 4 through 9. Then Peter, I love Peter. He's so great. And he always mouths off and when he shouldn't, like me and all that stuff. Then Peter answered and said to Jesus, Lord, it is good for us to be here. If you wish, let us make three tabernacles, one for you, one for Moses, and one for Elijah. Well, while he was still speaking, <laughs> behold, a bright cloud overshadowed them. And suddenly a voice came out of the cloud and the voice said, this is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. Hear him. And when the disciples heard it, what did they do? They fell on their faces and were greatly afraid. They had experienced what Moses had experienced. Verse 7. But Jesus came, Jesus, Jesus came and touched them. And he said, arise and do not be afraid. When they had lifted up their eyes, they saw no one but Jesus only. Now, as they came down from the mountain, 
Jesus commanded them, saying to them, Tell the vision to no one until the Son of Man is risen from the dead. That's how we know God rose from the dead. You see, here's the point. Jesus Christ paid the cost of sin. He paid the cost of your sin, and he paid the cost of my sin. The Lord Jesus Christ is God. Only God knows the price of sin. We don't know how much it costs because we don't understand what it's like. When we were born, we were born under sin, even though we had provision from God until we made decisions ourselves. But God himself knows the cost of sin. God himself paid the price of sin through Jesus Christ. That's what we're studying. The Lord Jesus Christ came, he lived, he was crucified. We'll get into that. Then he rose from the dead and he became alive again. And now he's glorified sitting at the right hand of God, sent his Holy Spirit so that if we believe in him and we say, Jesus Christ, forgive me of my sin. Help me today. We pray. Just pray out loud and say, Jesus Christ, forgive me of my sin. Help me today. I need you so desperately. Would you live in my life? Would you be alive in my life? I need you now. And then he'll come in. And what Jesus Christ will do is give you his Holy Spirit. And when he gives you his Holy Spirit, your life is going to totally change, slowly but surely. God will begin to work with you. God will begin to become alive in you. And you will begin to witness the change that God has made to you. A lot of people are talking about the end of time. He says that, they say that, and everybody on TV says something else. But what does Jesus Christ say? The Son of God, God and man, what does he say? That's so important. We need to come back to Matthew 24 and look at that because Jesus Christ does not lie. Today we are continuing to study through the Gospel of Matthew, and I want to take some time and focus in on a group of people that's mentioned often in the Gospels, not just here in Matthew, but in Mark, Luke, and John as well, the scribes and the Pharisees. Now, in a really simplistic understanding, almost a childlike understanding of the Scriptures, it's really easy to kind of see Jesus and the disciples as the good guys, and the scribes and the Pharisees and some of those other groups like the Sadducees and the Zealots as the bad guys. But this would be a mischaracterization of what's actually going on in the Gospels. The truth, much like real life, is much more complicated than that. The scribes and the Pharisees were religious leaders. They were devout uh, Jews in the time of Jesus. And Jesus himself was a devout Jew. And in fact, the devoutness, the, the dedicatedness of the scribes and the Pharisees to God and to the law of God uh, found in the Old Testament of the Bible is is actually what brought them to discuss and disagree, uh, and in some cases agree with Jesus as well. So let's take a look, first of all, at some of their defining characteristics. If you were a scribe and a Pharisee in the time period of Jesus, what made you different than the Sadducees, for example, or a regular person just going about their lives? Take a look. In the New Testament Gospels, it's common to read references to the scribes and Pharisees. These two groups held a prominent place within first century Judaism. It's commonly acknowledged that the term scribe generally refers to people who are tasked with writing down words and histories. Within Judaism, this meant specifically the copying of Hebrew scriptures. The scribes' resulting familiarity with the scriptures led many to become well-respected as experts and teachers in the Law of Moses. In 1st century AD Judaism, scribes could come from any of the religious denominations, but it's frequently assumed that most came from the sect of the Pharisees. The Pharisees became a recognizable group during the time between the events of the Old and New Testaments. The term may mean separatist, as they were opposed to the king-priest designation claimed by the Hasmonean dynasty. Their rival religious faction in this respect became the Sadducees, who had embraced the king-priest concept. 
Pharisees were generally not from the nobility or wealthier classes of people. Their top priority was applying the scriptures to the everyday life of the everyday Jew. This took the shape of teachings or rules about the laws of Moses, how to follow the Mosaic law in contemporary life. Their knowledge, paired with their normal stations in life and their concern for the everyday man, made Pharisees very popular influencers with the masses. Alternatively, they were treated with suspicion and fear by some of the much smaller upper class. Pharisees seem to have been anti-Roman in that they wanted political and religious freedom without mixing pagan culture into Judaism, but they were also usually non-violent, preaching instead that as the masses turned to God, he would provide deliverance. Their distinguishing religious beliefs included their insistence on the immortality of the soul, the existence of angels and demons, a combination of free will choice and God's predestination, future rewards and punishments in the afterlife, and a physical bodily resurrection. So in the days and weeks to come, we are going to be taking a look at some of the other groups that are mentioned in the Gospels. Uh, but for now, this is a good starting place to recognize one of these key op opponents, I guess you would say, but these people, these religious people, these devout people that Jesus had interactions with. And of course, we see that uh, we see Jesus challenging uh, their understanding of scripture and the traditions that they had built on top of scripture. And Jesus really gives getting back to the heart of the scripture. You know, sometimes as humans, it's really easy to get away from the actual meaning of something that we do. We see this in anything that we do. We see this in cultural traditions that we have, in religious traditions that we have. A lot of times they become traditions unto themselves, divorced from or separated, I should say, from the truth on which they started. And pretty soon we're just doing them because of the tradition's sake itself and they've lost all of their meaning. A lot of that was going on, and we read that in the Gospels. And Jesus, one of Jesus' missions was to bring everyone back to the heart, the core truth uh, of the Word of God. Ryan, what do you have for us today? Thanks, Corey. Well, today in our assigned reading of Matthew chapter 16 to 18, we read of the famous transfiguration of Jesus Christ. And it's at this point that Moses and Elijah actually show up on the mountain with Jesus and Peter, James, and John. And it's because of Moses and Elijah's appearance here that many believe that they will be the two witnesses that will come before Jesus Christ's second coming. Another name often mentioned in connection with these two witnesses is, of course, Enoch. But what does the Bible tell us about these two coming witnesses? Let's study. Just as Satan in the Great Tribulation will use two men to carry out his evil agenda, namely the Antichrist and the False Prophet, so too will God raise up two men, two bright lights to shine for him in the darkness. The Bible calls these two men the two witnesses, and Revelation chapter 11 verses 3 through 14 describes their ministry. God will anoint these two special witnesses who will minister on his behalf amid the darkness and devastation. Just as John the Baptist was the forerunner for the Messiah, these two witnesses will pave the way for his return. Though the Bible is silent regarding the particular identity of these two men of God, early Christians such as Tertullian, Irenaeus, and Hippolytus believed Enoch and Elijah will reappear during the tribulation and will be the two witnesses. Some have held that Moses will be one of the two witnesses, along with either Enoch or Elijah. And still others believe that these two witnesses will not be men from the past at all, but rather will be new Jewish prophets which God will raise up. The main reason Enoch and Elijah are thought to be the two coming witnesses is because neither of these men saw death. Thus it is reasoned that they will come back to die in the tribulation. Often Hebrews chapter 9 verse 27 is used as evidence, for it is appointed unto men once to die. However, this verse is simply establishing the general truth that all must die. There will be millions of exceptions to this general rule at the rapture. And there already have been some exceptions to this rule, such as Lazarus, whom Jesus raised up. Another problem is that Enoch's future death would seem to be a reversal of Hebrews chapter 11 verse 5, which clearly explains that as a reward for his total faithfulness to God, Enoch was translated that he should not see death. Those who identified the two witnesses with Moses and Elijah base this on two main facts. 
First, both men appeared with Christ on the Mount of Transfiguration, which foreshadowed the glory of Christ at his second coming. And second, they are mentioned in tandem in the final chapter of the Old Testament. Also, the miracles which Moses and Elijah performed are similar to those that will be performed by the coming two witnesses. Another big reason Elijah is identified as one of the two witnesses is because the Bible predicts that he will in fact return previous to Christ's second coming. However, some see Moses and Elijah's presence at the Transfiguration as rather flimsy evidence, hardly showing a cause and effect relationship. Also, the fact that the miracles performed by the two witnesses are similar to those performed by Moses and Elijah is hardly sufficient evidence, for God can use others to perform these same miracles. And though the Bible predicts Elijah's return, it does not necessarily mean that he will be one of the two witnesses. Thus, the identity of these two men remains rather obscure. So there you go. We really can't be sure who the coming two witnesses will be. But what we can be sure of is that God will send them to prepare the way for his second coming, just as he sent John the Baptist to prepare the way for his first coming. And that is absolutely incredible. All right. So what we're going to say here is we're going to say, OK, uh, we're going to give you the the answer to the question. Who are the two witnesses? OK, who are the two witnesses in Revelation? And here's the answer. Are you ready for it? I guarantee sure. you. Here's the answer. We don't know. We don't yeah. know. Exactly. We have no idea. Nope. I mean, there are people that they, they preach sermons on this, you know, well, it's this guy and that guy and Moses, and, you know. We can speculate. We can, and we do, but only God knows, and he didn't tell us in his word. Mm -hmm. We'll so find we, out eventually. That's right. Yeah. It's not important for <laughs> us to that. know. Right. Find out eventually. Yeah, exactly. And uh, so, but we will we'll learn and we'll know from heaven. And that's what I believe. So it's going to be very interesting how that all plays out. And I believe that we're in the birth pangs. This is what I personally, uh, Rod Hembry, what I personally believe, we're in the birth pangs of this whole thing. Mm -hmm. So it's very, very interesting. We'll find out. <laughs> and we'll find out. We'll find out if we are. Okay, Janice, you're up. All right. Well, I titled this today, Hear Him. And the subtitle is his plans, not our plans. And the note to myself was, I love Peter. I love this disciple. <laughs> and I think a lot of us can relate to him. He wears his emotion on his sleeve. He's ready to get in there and defend and, and do all these things. And, and we see this magnificent scene where Jesus takes Peter, James and John, um, his brother, uh, John, the brother of James, and he takes them up to the high mountain and Jesus is transfigured before them. And Peter doesn't know how to respond. So he just makes this statement. Let's read it. It's uh, 17 verses four and five. Then Peter answered and said to Jesus, Lord, it is good for us to be here. It's good for us to be here. If you wish, let us make here three tabernacles, one for you, one for Moses, and one for Elijah. Because all of a sudden before them, there's Jesus and he's being transfigured before them. His face is shining, his clothes are shining, and Moses and Elijah are there talking to him. Imagine. So Peter didn't know what to do. So he's talking and he's declaring this. And then it says in verse five, while he was still speaking, so while Peter is talking about, we should do this and we should do this and we should do that. Because he's excited. He's excited and probably a little bit scared. While he was still speaking, behold, a bright cloud overshadowed them. And suddenly a voice came out of the cloud saying, this is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. Hear him. Hear him. It's like Peter's in the middle of this great announcement about we should do this and we should do that. And here's what the good plan is. And this is good for us to be here. <laughs> and I get like that, don't I? I'm kind of like that right now. I start to talk and I'm hearing myself talking. And sometimes the plans are good. Sometimes not so good. Sometimes it just comes out of excitement or fear or whatever. And God interrupts him and says, mm -hmm. listen to my son, hear him. So, so oftentimes we can have our plans, we can have our ideas, and they can seem like the best plans ever. But as followers of Jesus Christ, we must always pray about the moves that we make because God is interested. Did you know that? 
God is interested in the decisions that you make because they have an effect not just on you, but on the people around you and they can have a lasting impact. And we all know that from past things that we've done or said and the results of it. And Proverbs chapter three, verses five and six is a favorite of Rod and I for sure and many of you out there as well. Trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean not on your own understanding. In all your ways, acknowledge him, acknowledge God, and he shall direct your paths. Mm. And um, so just like Peter, it's good to have emotion and it's good to move forward and say things, but let's always check <laughs> with the Lord. And when he speaks, let's hear him and be pliable, moldable enough to to maybe understand that not all of our ideas now, are the way to go. Have you ever said something that you wish you hadn't said? Oh, a lot. <laughs> have you ever said mm-hmm. something you wish you For hadn't sure. said? Have you ever said oh, something? Yeah, 100%. You should... yeah. Okay, and I have 100%. I've said things I should not have said before. I think all of us can do that. And when we trust in the Lord, when we make the Lord the head, when we, when we pray and we say, God, I want to do what you want to do. That becomes a hard thing because we talk about, you know, free speech, free speech, and we're ready to demonstrate for free speech. But not necessarily. If we're Christians, we've given up our rights to Jesus Christ. We have to pray first and say, Lord, I'd like to say this and I'd like to do that, but help me to do it in a way where people come to know you, where people come to know you. It's not about me expressing myself, what I want, but it's about me expressing what you have done for me, what you have done for me and expressing it in a way where people get it and understand it. So I think that's something that's very important, mm-hmm. Janice. And uh, that's something- And he may, he may ask you to speak something that would be very difficult or do something that would be Jeremiah. very difficult, but uh, God will give you the strength if yeah. he's called you to do it. Absolutely, Hosea, Jeremiah, we can name the prophets. But God speaks to us as we speak to the people.